This is Umar Ahmed for IFL TV in association with MTK Global. Lee Selby's back. He's back in Wales after, what, six or seven Umar's years? Back. <laughs> Umar's back. How you doing, son? Very well, thank good you. Yourself? All good, mate. All good. Here in Cardiff. Sunny Cardiff. They packed me off this morning. I was like, just that travelling salesman, mate. Got the bag. Off we go. Train to Liverpool Street. Liverpool Street tube to Hammersmith. Uh, Paddington, rather. Paddington down to Cardiff. Running across the platform, trying to get my people laughing at me. Eddie, hey, Yeah, mate, we're here, we're grinding, and they're looking forward to May the 9th. Good turnout today. Really good. I think that when you come back somewhere that you haven't been for a long time, especially when they're a, a good fight city, it's a bit like Newcastle, you know, when we went back there, you get an opportunity to make a run here if you've got the talent. And with Joe Caldina particularly, I believe this kid is going to be a world champion. But Lee Selby has a monstrous fight against George Cambosis Jr., final eliminator for the IBF world title. I said in the press, I feel a little bit sorry for Lee because maybe the casual fans don't know a lot about Cambosis. Fucking all action, tough, can punch, fast hands. It's going to be a thrilling fight. And this is a really tough fight for him, but obviously if he wins, he faces the winner of Lomachenko against Teofimo Lopez. So big opportunity for him. Joe Caldina as well. He's going to be in a big fight. I think he can fight for a world title at the end of 2020. Chris Billum smith against Nathan Forley. A Commonwealth Cruiserweight Championship, James Tennyson against Gavin Gwynn for the British Lightweight title as well, Sean McGoldrick, John Doherty, Jamie Cox back on the scene. I'm um, looking forward to it. Only holds about 5,000 and with what these guys have ordered, we ain't got many left already. So I think we're going to have a nice night, good crowd and a great night of boxing. Before we talk about the main event, Joe Cordini said he might be boxing some ex-world champs this year. Yeah, he's. Uh, I'm surprised. You know, Tony Sims is a very conservative trainer as all good trainers are. You know, they want to make sure they go at the right pace. But when he believes in the fighter, when he believes they're ready, he's ready to let those shackles off. So, you know, look, one of the guys actually turned the fight down last night was Johnny Gonzalez. You know, these kind of levels of opponents, I think we need to start looking at for Joe Caldina. Top 15 guys with the governing bodies because now it's about positioning him. You know, when he was up at lightweight, he won the British Commonwealth European, uh, sorry, not European, uh, British Commonwealth titles. And he was moving up the governing bodies. Now he's down at 130 pounds. We've got to look at which way we're going to go. You know, I love the Jamel Herring fight for Joe Caldina. Carl's boxing him next, is. isn't it? I love the Carl Frampton fight for Joe Caldina. But Carl's got, uh, Joe has got to become a name, you know, because otherwise they'll look at Joe Caldina and go, why would I box Joe Caldina? It's the easy get out of jail card but it's also a true card. Now, Carl Frampton's not going to want to fight Joe Caldina. He will do if it becomes a pay-per-view fight. Now, John O'Carroll, that's a good fight with Joe Caldina. But again, John O'Carroll's going to go, I want world title fights. I don't want Joe Caldina. Joseph Diaz, you know, just beat Tevin Farmer. He ain't, he don't even know, who, well, he will know who Caldina is, but we've got to get those fights that make people take note. And we've got to keep building Joe Caldina. I feel that Joe's a quiet guy and a, a real classy guy family man keeps himself to himself and I think sometimes because of the lack of brashness if you like or noise he goes a little bit under the radar it's our job to make sure he doesn't and he has all the abilities to fly well over the radar because he's a great fighter and I believe he's young he's fresh he's good looking he's exciting you know and again this is hard to say because he was such a legend but it reminds me of a young Joseph Calzaghe you know he boxes with the same kind of intensity and style you know he looks a little bit like him you know, and I think that, honestly, I believe Caldina is going to go all the way. I really do. Do you feel like he needs to be a little bit more vocal as he moves up? I think that his style is, is like, like I said. You know, if you looked at him, you'd think he was a bit Jack the Lad, but he's not really. You know, and I think that we should never ask people to be something that they're not. I think we should enjoy the fact that this kid works hard behind closed doors. We should enjoy the fact that he's got a couple of kids and he's a family man and he likes to spend time with them and not be out in nightclubs and, you know, buying in sports cars and, you know, expensive clothes and just spunking everything up the wall. Let's appreciate that we've got a hard-working kid who could go on and be a great world champion for Wales and Britain. So I want everybody to, you know, all these young fighters right now that are approaching that moment, that pivotal moment, and I'm talking mainly about Josh Kelly fighting David Avenesia, Boatsy, not necessarily on March 28th, but probably the next one. Joe Caldina probably in this one, or certainly the next one. 
when they're all in those 50 50 fives. Kohli Glowacki. Kohli Glowacki's done it consistently, Lawrence Akoli. We've got to get behind them because these guys are the future of, of the sport in this country. And you've got to get behind Joe Calder, Caldino. I want everybody to get behind him, follow him. He's grafting, he's, he's hustling every day to improve as an individual and improve as a fighter. And he could be a world class fighter. Where does Joshua Boatz's big fight come from? That comes soon, probably in a final eliminator for the IBF. Also the Caparelli fight that we're looking to reschedule. I think that will probably come on the AJ card. He will box on March 28th. He's been out for seven or eight months now. He'll be fighting an undefeated fighter that we'll be announcing this week. But all these guys, they still only had you know, 10, 11, 12 fights. But it's almost crunch time already. You know, They come out of that cycle of Rio 2016. And it's almost like when the next Olympics comes around, that's the moment you get slung in. You know, for Anthony Joshua, he won gold in 2012. Well, he was fighting for world titles in 2016. Yeah, I think it's 2016. So same kind of thing. So these guys have got to be looking at this next 12 month period. I think Boatsy, I think Josh Kelly, I think uh, Joe Caldina, they should all be looking to fight for world titles in the next 12 months. A Coley is, you know? So they're flying and we've got to get behind them. We would like to see Boatsy Yard. I don't know whether that happens soon. Boatsy, Yard. 100%. What, what do you make of Yard fighting Lyndon Arthur? I think it's a good fight. I mean, um, it's, it's a. Uh, why I like the fight um, is because it's very unusual for you to fight Kovalev and do really well. And, you know, you, you might have been a minute away in one round for, from becoming world champion. To fighting a domestic guy, and, and this isn't a. You know, our, Lyndon Arthur's a good young fighter, but no one really knows who he is yet. So I like it from Yard because it's a weird one where you give someone else an opportunity to beat you who no one's really heard of, where you could be fighting. See, I, I would have liked to fight for him like Sullivan Barrera, you know, like those kind of Joe Smith Jr., you know, those kind of guys. Um, Jesse Hart. Will that be boxing needs? Yeah, that, that's who it, I, listen, I love the Sullivan Brera. Sullivan Brera is the perfect gatekeeper. He's a tough fucker. But if you, if you can't beat him, you ain't ready for a world championship. So I would have probably matched Yard in those fights. But this is a good fight. Just a kind of no-win fight for Anthony Yard. Because he's expected to win easy. But he might not. Who knows? You know? So, but Boatsy Yard is a monstrous pay-per-view fight. And we do that now. You know, we can do it now, we can do it for world titles, it doesn't matter. But I feel like they're the kind of fights that we need to all be pushing together to make because that, that's a proper, proper scrap. Lee so will be a huge incentive for him. He's going to box the winner of Lomachenko uh, Lopez yeah. if they keep that title. Yes. Um, but you, you keep saying about Compasis Jr., uh, really good fighter, unbeaten, coming over from Australia. Yeah. Good fighter. And again, I said to Selby, you know, Selby said, no, I, I sparred him at a wild card, I felt like I handled him well. I said, Lee, your biggest. Um, challenge will be the weight division because although you are a big guy and he's, he, you know, he's, he looks like a big lightweight it was only a couple of fights ago he's fighting 126 pounds Cambos is a strong ball you know go and watch his fights he's fucking all action this kid it's going to be an amazing fight and he's going to come at Selby from round one he knows he's fighting him in his backyard he's going to have to stick it on him and Lee will have to fight with him he can't just think that he can move and box and because he's going to get walked down by a very strong game kid. And uh, it's a great fight, really good fight. Jamie Cox, two years out of the ring, boxer likes of George Groves, John Ryder. Yeah. When he said to you he's coming back, like what was the conversation? Well, he was supposed to fight in Italy about six months ago, something like that. And uh, when that fell through, he was ill at the time. And he kind of didn't surface again. I thought he was done, to be honest with you. you know, and I, I never really felt like I had the opportunity to build Jamie properly for when we signed him because... We got him that one fight on the Errol Spence Kell Brook card, and then we got the invite to go in the World Boxing Super Series. The money was too good, the opportunity was too good to turn down. He got Groves in the first round, the quarterfinals. Actually, put up a good fight, but got just a peach of a fucking body shot. And then it was a weird one against John Ryder where he didn't beat the count. And I never expected it to see his career finish then, but the level of inactivity made me think that there might not be a way back for Jamie Cox. I'm pleased to see him back. I think he punches very hard. I think he's very exciting. He's teamed up with Tony Borg. So really, he just needs to win this fight and look good. And I think he jumps into any kind of big fight. So um, people have been saying about Jamie Cox for years and years about his ability. 
But people have been saying that about other fighters. Frankie Gavin, a great example. I mean, the amount of people who come up to me and said, you know, Frankie Gavin, as a kid, was unbelievable, but could never, I say could never quite do an approach. Still had a great professional career, fought for the world title, won domestic titles. But Jamie Cox is another one. You know, won Commonwealth Championships, um, fought for the world title, but many believed he would go on to be a world champion. It's not too late, but he needs to look good May 9th. Chris Billum Smith, Nathan Foley, and James Tennyson and Gavin Gwynn. I think Billum Smith and, and Tennyson are the favourites, but yeah. decent fights are. Especially when they're coming to the other guys, yeah. home countries, home support. I mean, when you look at those two fights, I, I really like Billum Smith because I think he's got such a wonderful attitude. You know, we gave him that opportunity against React Ball. Very close fight, could have gone either way. He lost that fight. The opportunity came up to fight Craig Glover, Liverpudlian, in Liverpool for the Commonwealth title. Jumped straight in. You know, this fight in Wales against a Welshman who's, what, 16, 17 and 0? 17 and 0. Uh, Commonwealth Games medalist, great amateur. Yep, no problem. You know, they understand that you've got to make a name for yourself. And if they can keep getting TV slots, keep being in good fights, you know, they're going to get opportunities. You look at that domestic division at the moment with the cruiserweights, like I said, um, you've got Nathan Forley, you've got Chris Billum Smith, you've got uh, Dion Juma, you've got React Paws, a British champion, you've got Tommy McCarthy, he's about to fight for the European title, Lawrence Acoli stepping up to fight for the world title. It's an amazing scene at the moment, the cruiserweights, and Billum Smith right there. Tennyson against Gavin Gwynn is an absolute war. I mean, you watch Gavin Gwynn against Joe Caldina, he did not stop coming. But Tennyson has got absolute fire in both hands. I think right now, one of the biggest punchers in the lightweight division. He was a big puncher at Super Feather. Up at lightweight, he's looking, I mean, his fight with Craig Evans was brutal. But that is going to be a thrilling fight because both guys come forward. He's going to have huge support from Wales. And Tennyson is looking beyond British titles, but he wants to capture that first. You mentioned Richard Reactport. Is he going to be fighting Dion Jermaine X? Yeah, it's, it's his mandatory. But he did have a hand operation. It's a case of when he'll be back. They talk about the end of May, but I think re realistically it will be in June. Um, great fight. Dion Juma, good fight last time out against Sam Hyde. And like I said, so many great fights in the division. Moving on, uh, I caught up with Dan Raphael in New York over the weekend. I'm not sure whether you saw his comments. He said he spoke to Bob Arum and he said that you and Bob have no conversations about Joshua Fury. Yeah, I text Dan about that. And I said... Because I saw one of your headlines. You know how you do it, you know what I mean? Well, he did say it. Well, he did, but you did sensationalise it again. And I said... I sent him your screenshot, look. And I said, lol, only about six phone calls. And he said, as I said, I was not there. I'm not calling anyone a liar, but I actually believe you on this. If you think that, like, obviously, you have to understand that I'm making a Pulev fight as well, right? So I'm speaking to Bob Arum anyway. It's not like we're negotiating a Fury Wilder fight. Do you honestly believe in the six or ten conversations I had with him post AJ Fury that I did not have a conversation with him about that fight? We talked about venues. We talked about splits. We talked about TV networks and how it would all work. We talked about step-aside money. But we had conversations. We didn't have negotiations. It's all irrelevant because the only people that are going to make this fight is MTK anyway. So it doesn't matter if I'm talking to Bob, it doesn't matter whether I'm talking to Frank, they need to speak to MTK because they're going to make the fight, we're happy to make the fight with them. But at the moment, there isn't anything major to discuss, only that there's an infrastructure for a deal. We've got to go to different sites, see what the opportunities are for the fighters. We're ready to move forward with that and make the fight. But first we have Pulev on, Ju on June 20. They have Wilder on July the 18th. The winners fight the winners, simple. And we'll contract with either party Wilder or Fury to make that fight but listen to say that I've not talked to Bob Arum is ridiculous ridiculous do you, you know how you know how money hungry Bob Arum is you don't think that he's going to talk to me about the biggest fight in the world bar none so yeah probably not just one conversation probably six conversations but they're all irrelevant because we're all talking to the wrong people I know Dan texted that. Dan did say, though, he doesn't believe the fight happened this year because you guys won't be able to get a deal done before Joshua fights Pulev and Fury fights Wilder in the third fight. He believes that how can you make a deal before that, those very guys easy, fight? Very easily. You say, if we win this fight, we will fight you on these terms. Yes, and if we win these fights, we will fight you on these terms. Uh, it's not me, yeah, so Dan no, just no, said. No, but that's, all right, that's all right, but we don't have to do a deal before the fight. 
we can do, but I don't understand it won't happen this year because that fight's going to happen first. Those fights are in June and July. So we know the fight's going to take place in December. So I, I don't see... Uh, listen, for the conversations I've had with Bob and MTK, they want the fight. Does Fury want to fight Joshua? Of course. Does Joshua want to fight Fury? Of course. So why not? I don't, I don't think it's going to be that difficult, to be honest with you. It's just going to be a, a situation on their side. They're so fragmented. And we've just got to talk to the right people, which we believe we know we, we are. Something about this fight that puzzles me is that ESPN is a pro pay-per-view platform. Designers existence is to abolish pay-per-view. So how on earth is that going to work? Well, they have to come up with a solution between them. And it, listen, again, not talking on behalf of the zone, but it will probably be to have some kind of pay system. It's got to be the same across the platforms. You know, ESPN aren't going to say it's $80 pay-per-view, but the zone, you can get it for $19.99 a month. Or no, but if you look at the, a lot of the other pay-per-views on ESPN, a lot of it includes an annual subscription on ESPN+. Plus. So I don't see the problem for the zone to say the same in terms of that price point. The zone is £99 a year. That pay-per-view might be $79. Maybe the zone says it's $79 for the fight, but you get the year subscription. So it's not, you know, I don't know. That's a conversation for them. But certainly we want the zone involved with the fight, absolutely. ESPN have to be involved in the fight. So we just find a solution. Again, that was another conversation I had with Bob. And, and nothing from that conversation seemed troubling. And I think you'll see more of that, actually. I think you're going to see more networks sharing fights. But it has to be on the same price point, because otherwise the model won't work. Fury, we know, is contracted with ESPN, American platform. They're going to be totally against a fight going to Saudi Arabia or anywhere in the Middle East. Do you not think? Surely. No. no. I mean, certainly not the conversations I've had. I mean, the zone are also an American platform. They've already aired a fight from the Middle East with Joshua Reed's done huge numbers for them. Bob has no issue at all with the fight going to uh, Saudi Arabia. By the way, it doesn't mean it's going to go there. They're going to make a huge play for this fight. And in December, your options do become a little bit limited. Right now in the UK, the only place we can stage it in December is at the Millennium Stadium. So who's going to come up with the money? You know, the government or someone has to come up with the money to incentivise us to hold this fight here. We're already incentivised because it's an all-British undisputed fight between two Brits that we want here. But there is going to be such a disparity between the two numbers, it's going to be difficult to convince the fighters that this is actually the right place to do it in December. I believe you're going to see this fight twice, maybe three times. Whoever fights for that undisputed. So maybe there's one in England, there's one in Saudi, there's one in Vegas, I don't know. But it's our job now to go out with MTK and say, right, this is the, this is the situation. This is how much for Wales. This is how much for Vegas. This is how much for, uh, for Saudi. Guys, it's over to you. AJ, your team, have a look at this. Fury, your team, have a look at this. If you like it, if you like the terms, the split seems quite straightforward. The networks are going to work like this. You want to go and do it? And I think the answer will be yes. We know you've got a partnership with Saudi. Mm -hmm. Any other Middle East territories come in for this fight? Well, we will work exclusively with Saudi. Um, there will be other Middle East, of course. Listen, since I did my uh, show in uh, December, I've had four Middle East countries approach me to stage events there. Saudi and Prince Khalid and uh, Skills Challenge were the, were the people who in, entrusted me to make this happen. So they have my loyalty. And I've refused many approaches from other territories to stage events because right now we're planning our event in July and we would like to look at big heavyweight fights, whether it's December, whether it's next year, whether it's the year after. So everybody talks a good game. I would rather be in the business with people that deliver. And right now, those people have delivered for me and they are our partners. Now, am I right in saying you've cancelled two events in Italy? Yes. Because uh, of coronavirus? Yes. Disappointing, you know. One was Gamal Yafai, and he's had so much bad luck fighting for the European title. Um, it's a concern. You know, we was, uh, our operational team were with the government yesterday to talk to rights holders about events and, and precautions to take around this. Again, I'm not, I can't, like I'm not talking for the zone, I'm not talking for the government either, but I don't think... It doesn't seem like there's any immediate concern to stop live events. I think, obviously, if it got to a stage where those kind of precautions would have to take place, then they're, they're obviously going to look at it. Um, Italy is a completely different scenario of numbers. Scary, really. I mean, it's like a ghost town everywhere you look at. Um, right now, for us, business as usual.
you know, it's quite interesting because I had a lot of calls from promoters today, some from Italy and some from Poland, that announced this morning that they were going to limit all events to a thousand, saying, can we, we've had this show fall through, can we put these fights on your card? There's going to be a lot of international fighters that are made to wait. Hopefully, this doesn't affect British boxing because obviously, listen, the welfare and the health of the public is absolute paramount. But also, there's a lot of people that are going to miss out on a chance to earn money, chance to provide for their family, etc., etc. So, it doesn't mean that, oh, we'll just do it anyway. But obviously, it's an important time for British fighters and worldwide fighters because when you miss a date, it doesn't just mean you can go two weeks later or three weeks later or four weeks later. All these big fighters are like jumbo jets circling around the airspace. And when it's your time to land, when it's your time to fight, you come down, you land, and you get it on. But if not, you circle and you circle and you circle, waiting for radio control to say, come in, son, let's go, tear up time. And you come down and go. So the worry for fighters is when you miss a date, look at um, uh, Jose Ramirez, supposed to box beginning of Feb. Right, in China. Now boxing May the 9th. He hasn't boxed since he beat Maurice Hooker in a unification. It's a year nearly since he's boxed. Maurice Hooker would have boxed twice in that time. But fighters get unlucky and it's, it's, a, it's a concerning time for boxers and also, listen, also for rights holders and also the world. And we hope that our country can contain it. So you haven't been contacted from any sports ministers in the government about... Well, we had a meeting yesterday with uh, the government and with rights hold, major rights holders who were being talked about to talk about precautions and what was happening. And, and again, the, the feedback was, doesn't seem imminent that anything's going to be cancelled. But obviously, look, if it got to a stage like Italy, you've got no choice, have you? But um, you know, again, it's not just uh, boxing, it's a situation... Let me just get this one second. Hello. Just last year, you got to go. So, uh, Billy Joe Canelo, what's going on? Yeah, just finalising the agreements. Uh, they sent a contract through. We sent our responses through, nothing major. Just waiting for the reply from that. But Billy Joe, ready to fly out. He's going to spend his camp in the States, probably fly this week. And I, yeah, and I believe uh, tomorrow, actually. And, and I believe uh, there'll be a press conference next week. Callum Smith, what happens with him? Danny Jacobs? Danny Jacobs fight. Uh, spoke to the PBC guys last night. Obviously, the Caleb Plant fight. You've got Chris Eubank Jr. as well as a name that was mentioned. So, need to get a big fight for him ASAP. All right, Eddie Ann, thank you very much. Cheers. Thanks.